So one observation, as we increase the temperature, what do you think would happen to the vapor pressure? Say that one more time. As your temperature increases, what happens to the amount of gas above a liquid? We should get more gas. So the vapor pressure is going to increase. Right? So your vapor pressure is proportional to your temperature. They're directly tied. Right? Um, let's look at something that doesn't really involve vapor pressure, but it's kind of dealing with it. <clears throat> what if I want to dissolve a gas into a liquid? So we've done this before. Right? I dissolved a solid into a liquid, right? What did I do to dissolve a solid into a liquid? I heated it up. Okay? I heated up the solid because what did that do? It started to break, and we haven't officially pushed the terminology, but started to break the attraction between the molecules so that it would be easier to dissolve. So we heated it up, and our solid dissolves easier. All right? What about dissolving gases in liquids? What do you think? Should we heat it up too? So pressure is fine to talk about. We'll add that in here, but I don't want to look at pressure yet. I want to look at temperature. Why cool it off? Heating it increased solubility for solids. Why would cooling it increase solubility for gases? I think you said it. Different directions. If we think about our phases, we have solids, which can go to liquids. Okay? And really what we're talking about here is not a liquid. We're actually talking about a solution, which I meant to spell out but couldn't, so we'll switch it to aqueous, up to gases. So when I go from a solid to a liquid, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to break all the forces away or the attractions between each particle of the solid so that they can be dissolved and look like a liquid. When I go to a gas and I want to make the gas into a liquid, what should I do? Well, the gas particles are constantly moving around. Liquids don't move as much. So what am I going to need to do? I want to cool the gas down so that it starts to move less so that it looks more like a liquid. So when we think about these dissolving processes, they're opposites of each other, not because, oh, they're exceptions, but they're going different directions when we think about the phase transitions, solid liquids and gases. Right? So with temperature, hotter solids dissolve better. With gases, I want cooler gases to dissolve better. Are there exceptions? Yes. Let's not worry about the exceptions. Focus on the overall trends. Okay. The other thing that was suggested was pressure. Okay. Is pressure something I'm going to need to worry about for the solids going into the gases? No. Why not? Pressure is something that is inherent to gases. Solids don't have a high vapor pressure, so we don't need to worry about their pressures. Okay? To go from a gas into a liquid, well, that pressure is the amount of force on the external container. If I'm trying to make the gas into a liquid, I want each of those gas particles to contact each other. But the whole point of a gas is that what is the distance between them? Large. So to make it like a liquid, I'm going to have to grab each of those things and physically draw them together. I'm going to have to force them together. I'm going to have to make sure that they have a large pressure on the outer environment because they're trying to escape. So an increased pressure and a decreased temperature are going to increase the solubility of gases into liquids. Is this something you've already seen? Propane. Propane. Sodas, right? you don't leave your soda in the car right, during the summer, because what happens? It gets gross. It, gets gross. <laughs> okay. it heats up the soda, okay? and assuming it's a closed container, when you heat it up, all of that gas tries to leave the liquid. There's very little space for it to leave, so what does it end up doing? Increasing the pressure on the container until the container can't hold the pressure anymore, and it explodes all over your car. 
I do want to bring it up because some people have experienced this. You take a hot soda, right? You didn't want it hot. You, nobody likes hot sodas, right? All right? So we want to cool it down. So where do we put it? <clears throat> we put it in the freezer. And you go, oh, but when I put it in the freezer, it explodes also. It is exploding in the freezer, but for a different reason. All right? When you put it into the freezer, it's not the gas expanding causing it to explode. It's the water turning into a solid. Water has a higher or lower density as a solid. That's why it floats, which means it takes up a larger volume than the liquid. So your soda will explode in the freezer also because of the phase change from liquid to solid. Water is a weird exception. It's one of the reasons why some people believe water is a reason why we have life. Because if our oceans froze the other direction from the bottom up because the solid was more dense, we'd permanently have solid oceans. We wouldn't have liquid water. Wow, that's great. Okay. Um, so, neat side little stories, so let's move on. <coughs> Units of pressure. How do we measure this pressure? I've already talked to one person that was like, oh my God, there's so many different units of pressure. That is true. There's only one unit of pressure that you need to be concerned about, though. What unit is that? Right Atmospheres. One atmosphere. Four, right? Why do we pick that one? Be because it's one. That's pretty much it. Okay? Nice and straightforward, easy number to remember. Okay? When we're thinking about atmospheric pressure, that sounds a lot like Atmosphere. atmospheres or ATMs. So it's the easiest one to memorize. So one atmosphere is our standard pressure. Okay? There are a variety of other pressure units. Why? Some of it is it depends on what you're doing with it. Some of it is how was it discovered. Okay? If we go, uh, I'm going to regret this, I always do. If we go back to our old school atmospheric barometer, we're measuring the pressure of the atmosphere. How did we mark or quantify that? We quantified it by the height of the mercury in that tube. How do you measure height? Centimeters, Centimeters inches. inches, right? meters, millimeters. Depending on what unit you want to use, you'll get different heights of mercury in the tube. Which means when we go to think about atmospheric pressure, you'll hear reference to 760 millimeters of mercury. Right? And you might think that sounds really weird because it's literally measuring the height of a tube of mercury. That's the definition. Okay? That can be a bit challenging to deal with because mercury is toxic. Right? So we kind of limit our exposure to that these days. Um, and we'll come up with other ways to measure it. Atmospheres allow us to simplify the numbers down. We don't get 760 millimeters of mercury. We don't get 76 centimeters. We don't get these weird numbers. We just switched all of those out so we get a nice clean unit. You could be asked to convert between any one of those unit systems. Could be. I will not. Okay. But let's real quickly look at what each of these things means. Okay, All of these are measures. Do you need me out of the picture? All of these are measures of pressure with regard to our standard. Okay, So one atmosphere is 29.9 inches of mercury. It is also 76 centimeters of mercury. It is also 760 torr. It is also 101 kilopascals, okay? which means we could establish the expression 29.9 inches of mercury over 14.7 PSI. That would now allow me to convert PSI into inches of mercury. Okay? That's what that diagram is trying to show, is all of the possible ways that you could come up with those relationships. I might ask you to do that in the homework questions, but that's it. Okay, so it's just a question of interpreting that. And by might, I probably already did. Yeah. I won't ask on the test. Why not? I don't want you to memorize all the conversion factors. I don't see the value added to that. Make sense? 
Okay. So, variables that affect gas pressure. So we got an idea on how to measure it. Now we want to understand how we can tweak it. Right? So how could I change the pressure of a gas? Heat. Okay? So I could change the temperature. So temperature and pressure are related to each other. Okay? How are they related? If you increase the temperature, you increase the pressure. Why? The faster the particles move, the more likely they impact the sides of the container. We increase the pressure. The pressure is that force on the outside of the container. Okay, what else could we do? Change the size of the container. Is it a really fancy way of saying? Volume. volume. So volume and pressure are related to each other. How are they related? Ah, uh, this is interesting. These are inversely related to each other. When we increase the volume, we decrease the pressure. If I take a gas trapped in there and I somehow increase the size of the container, what happens to the amount of particle hits on the outside? It goes down. I have the same number of particles present in there, but there's now a larger volume, which means fewer impacts on the sides. Okay? To show this a bit better, what we could actually do is show one over pressure. Okay? As pressure goes down, the volume will go up. Make sense? Okay, what else could we relate to it? Add more particles. We could increase the number of particles. Okay, and we'll see why I wrote that out in here in a second. As I increase the number of particles, what is that going to do to the pressure? Okay, it'll increase. If I increase our particle count, we increase pressure. How do we as chemists monitor number of particles? Okay, the number of particles is moles. Okay, weight is related to that. If I have more particles, I'm going to have more mass. Okay, but that's not strictly the number of particles. The number of particles is literally moles. Did I write temperature? Did you understand what I wrote by writing T? Okay. Did I write pressure? No. Did I write volume? No, but you understood it, right? Did I write a symbol for this? Last one. No. Which becomes a challenging question. What symbol do I want to use? Did you say not capital M? What's wrong with capital M? That's used already to represent molarity. So I can't use capital M. Okay, we could use MOL or MOLS if we wanted to plural, pluralize it, pluralize it, pluralize it. Okay? That's an awful lot of letters. I want to use one letter. N. Why N? Um, Mole does not begin with N. Number of particles, that's where the N is coming from. N is the correct abbreviation to represent this, particularly in the ideal gas law. Outside of ideal gas, we tend to not use the abbreviation N for moles, but it shows up a lot in ideal gas. Okay? So, <clears throat> why address this? Well, we, by observing these relationships, we can determine that there's an interesting pattern that comes out. That when I hold the moles and volume constant, temperature and pressure, will change in a linear fashion. Right? That there's that direct proportionality. So somebody went through and saw, well, all of these things are related to each other. I can arrange all of these things in such a way that I can get them to all come together into one expression. Right? 
each of the individual observations were made by different scientists and they got to attach names to them. Boyle's Law, Charles's Law, Gay-Lussac's Law, Avogadro's Law. Okay? Why? They discovered it, they got to stamp their name on it. I don't care about naming the relationship. I do care that you understand what that relationship is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, when we take all of that information, we can jam all of it into a single expression. Right? We can note that the pressure directly increases with moles, directly increases with temperature, and it's inversely related to volume. Okay? But it's not perfect. It's off by a little bit. It's off by a constant factor. So there's this weird constant in here. Okay, what is that constant factor? Okay, that constant factor was point zero shoot. Zero eight two one. Yeah, cool. There we go. That was that constant factor. Because it's a constant, it's always that number. Because it is always that number, what should we do? Memorize, Memorize it, which is really great following me stumbling over my memorization of the number. Okay? We don't work with gases all that often, okay? but when you do, you're supposed to have it memorized. Okay? And we'll address the units on that in a second. Okay? If I'm now going to put this into an expression where I don't have those units, I'm going to create a name for that constant. Okay? And I can call it the gas constant. That's cool. Just like I could call it number of particles, temperature, and volume. But I didn't write number of particles, temperature, and volume. What did I write? N, T, and V. So what do I want to write for my constant? I'll pick anything I want. And what was chosen was R. Why? Don't know. Maybe the guy's... Wait, discovered it was first. Rate? No. Nope, it's not a rate. It's and so that expression becomes super, super important because it now allows us to relate pressure, moles, temperature, and volume. Okay? And I can memorize this single expression to tell me all of those. Okay? So this one thing equals all of those and more. That's pretty cool. So I want to be able to use and think about that expression. Okay, so that expression is something that's worth memorizing, and sometimes you'll hear people reference it as... Just curious if anybody's heard it. Pivner. Okay. So Pivner is worth memorizing as... Kind of a mnemonic, I guess. I guess it is a mnemonic. Okay? That gets us all of those relationships. Okay? What are those relationships? Well, let's take a look at N and P. So the number of particles in relationship to the pressure of the container. So I'm concerned about this P and this N. The expression here for Avogadro's expression or Avogadro's law assumes the volume and the temperature are held constant. If they are held constant, that would be a constant, 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 right? What's a constant times a constant? Constant. Divided by a constant? A constant. And then we can invent a new symbol. Okay. Pressure and moles. What happens when I increase the number of particles? The pressure has to increase. That's why they're equal to each other. Pivnert gives me all of those expressions. Kind of make sense? Okay. So when we actually go through and quantify this, we get our, our gas constant. The numerical value is 0 0.0821 atmospheres times liters over moles times Kelvin. That's a pretty complex unit to have to memorize for a constant, right? Yeah? Yeah, okay. 
What is our unit for pressure? Units for pressure. Atmospheres. Our unit for volume. Liters. Unit for moles. Mole. Sorry. Unit for temperature. Celsius. That one becomes a bit challenging. We have three different units to choose from. Notice for R, it's in kelvins. Why do we pick kelvins? Look at our expression. PV equals NR. T. Focus on that temperature. Why did we prick Kelvin's for temperature? What is special about Kelvin that Fahrenheit and Celsius do not have? Absolute zero. It's not so much the absolute zero, it's the negatives. There are none. If I'm at a negative temperature, what does that mean about that expression? Something else would have to be negative. Can I have negative moles? Can I have less than an existence? No. Can I have less than an absolute pressure or less than a volume? That doesn't make sense. That's why Kelvin was created because it's based off of Pivner. It's based off of an absolute scale that ensures we don't have negative signs. Why? Because it makes our expression to show those relationships really easy. If we use a temperature that is negative, this expression turns into a giant mess. Okay? So we pick Kelvin as our temperature for this. So that unit that we had to memorize, atmospheres times liters over moles times Kelvin, do we actually have to memorize it? If we memorize Pibner, solve for R. Pressures are units of ATMs, volume is liters, moles, Kelvin. The unit is given to you straight out of the expression Pivner. I know people have been dying to memorize an equation. Yeah. Ta-da! This is your equation that you get to memorize. Okay? PV equals NRT. You now have an equation that you can memorize. Why make you memorize this instead of the other process? It is such a complex conversion unit that it's going to be hard to keep track of. Could you do it? Yes. Okay. It's more trouble than it's worth. Kind of make sense? Okay. Yeah, most people do. Right? The thing, and I remember Pivner because my chemistry teacher in high school, for whatever reason, tried to put it on a license plate. And she just put PV space NRT because they didn't have, for whatever reason, they didn't have equals. So she got a sticker for an equals and got pulled over because she was modifying her license plate. So... I don't know how true any of that is, but it was at least told to me. Okay. So, if we look at Pivner, this can be helpful because if I'm given a glut of information, moles, temperature, and volume, I can solve for pressure. If I'm given moles, temperature, and pressure, I can solve for volume. So we have three unknown variables, or three potential variables. That's not three. That's one, two, three, four. For the record, there's four. Four variables. If I'm given three of them, I can solve for the last one. Okay? So that's kind of nice. It's really just a plug and chug system. Kind of boring and straightforward, but that's how it works. Okay? And yeah, you would like some boring and straightforward. So there you go. Okay? So where... Pibner can kind of come in handy and is typically a little bit larger, is that if we take conditions for a gas, starting conditions, and we change something, that means we've changed the conditions. That is going to change the other variables. Okay? So we could solve for the new conditions based off the expression from R. Okay? It's a neat little system. It's really just dealing with a whole bunch of algebra and making sure you keep track of everything. So let's boil it down to what I would argue is a simple issue or a simple one. Why is this one simple? Containers 
The only thing that has changed is the container, so our volume and the pressure. So theoretically, in this question, we could jump to whoever's named law it is. I would argue we could still solve it from Pivner. What are we solving from? Okay. Well, the expressions are right above us. I need to know what the conditions are to start conditions A. And I need to know the conditions to end conditions B. All right, so let's go through and take a look at it. Pressure A, so we'll call it our initial. Well, let's call it pressure A. What happens to pressure A? The volume doubles. I actually don't know what the pressure is. Okay, so pressure A is just pressure A. That's it. I don't have any more information than that. Okay, what about volume A? It's also careful on that. These are our initial conditions. Okay, so the initial conditions are just that. I don't have any numbers to put in for any of these. But what about conditions B? What is pressure B? Unknown. It's actually what I'm solving for. That's my question mark. What is volume A? Sorry. Volume B. Volume B. Okay. The volume of the container is doubled. Okay. Which means the second condition is that I have twice the volume that I started with, which would mathematically mean 2 VA. What is NA? Fudge. N, B. It didn't change, which means N, B is? T, B. What's that? What does it say? The temperature and the moles are unchanged. Could the temperature change? Yes. If it did change, we would have to specify that in here. We don't need to specify it because it didn't change. So this is looking at a simple expression. We can now go and sub this information into the top. So pressure A, volume A, moles A, T A equals R. So we'll call that our red R. What would purple R be? What did we say R was? It's a constant, which means it's the same, which means all of these A's over here, I can now set equal to pressure B. What did I say pressure B was? question mark so that's unknown so we'll leave that as pressure B what did I say volume B was what did I say moles B was NB what did I say temperature B was what happens we can start cross canceling the moles of A cancel. Temperature of A cancels. The volume of A cancels. What would I be left with? P A P times P B times P A times P two. Okay, and we can put the two out front. P B. Did we solve the question? We wanted to know what happened to the pressure. Did we solve the question? No. No. What were we asked to solve for? PB. What did I just solve for? PA. So what do I need to do? Put the 2, divide both sides by 2. I get PA over 2 equals PB.
What happened to our pressure? It was cut in half. Make sense? Yeah. Answer choices. That's all I'm going to do right now. What's our answer choice? A, B, or C? C halved. Does that make sense? You will absolutely see A show up because it looks like it's doubling. Okay? So you have to watch out and make sure that you appropriately manipulate the algebra. Make sense? Okay. You do not actually have to solve numerically for these. What you do need to be able to do is solve algebraically. That becomes important. We good? Okay. So, we got an equation up here. How many moles of neon gas occupy 2.34 liters at STP? What are you being asked to solve for? Moles of neon. Moles of neon. Okay. Neon gas. We're going to set this up. Yes is neon gas. Why are you emphasizing the gas? Why are you emphasizing that it's a gas? I, I, I'm just trying to check. It, just because it's a gas? It's not diatomic, and that's really what I was pushing at. Neon is not one of the diatomic elements. We shouldn't be writing it as Ne2. It should be just Ne because it's not diatomic. Okay, that's what I was nervous about. If you're emphasizing it's gas, that could be really, really important for this solve. Okay? So we've got the work sort of set up. I'm not setting up any more work behind it because I want you to try and figure it out. And we'll set up a little race here. We'll see who gets there first. Oh, I hate doing this. Feel free to shout out when you solve it first. Are you assuming anything? Look at the question. Are you assuming anything? Did you already solve it? Is that what you're saying, point one? Yeah, does someone support you? What, what I'm writing is not what you did? No. Okay, we'll deal with that in a second. trying to prove a point. Okay, I think I finally got it. I wasn't looking at the time, but I think that was about five minutes later.
Did everybody get the same answer? Did everybody get the same work? Did everyone who tried get the same work? Everybody that tried did this exact work. No. Did anybody do this exact work? No, sir. What? Really? I'm... I don't know about that. I think you guys actually did do the same work. So, let's take a look at what's in red there. In red... One... Mole liters. What I got in red, point zero. Didn't I do exactly what you guys did? That looked kind of familiar, right? You guys just. You guys just did the 2.34 liters times 22.4 liters and one mole. You just did that? Yep. Isn't that what I did? No. I wasted time. What I did is exactly the exact same thing. Yes, after you can okay. each other. Uh, after you can. That conversion factor that you used or that you are told to memorize comes directly out of PV equals NRT. When you sub in for standard pressure, one atmosphere, standard temperature, 273 Kelvin. Why would somebody do that? Why would they have invented that conversion factor? Because they figured someone is going to use standard pressure and standard temperature so often that they simplified all of the calculations that we showed down below to get to a new constant that simplifies the calculation. Okay? They created an algorithm to solve the question faster. Okay? Which really makes a lot of sense if the conditions that were established for that conversion factor and that algorithm were logical, sensical, useful things. When was the last time you used any volume of gas in an experiment? Never. Okay. When were you at standard t pressure? I don't know. Don't know. We're close, but we aren't there. When were you at standard temperature? Pressure. Cold. Cold. Standard temperature. <laughs> we could be at standard pressure when we go to the beach in Antarctica. Like, these conditions don't make sense. So if you're at a system where you're not at standard temperature and pressure, you can still do this conversion. You're just using PV equals NRT. That's where it came from. It's just subbing in those numerical values because someone thought that that approximation or simplification would be useful. Is it useful? I'll leave you to decide that. Okay? You, my opinion should be very obvious about that. Does that make sense? We good? Cool. So, we rearranged it already. We showed that it comes out to the exact same thing. So what do I want you to do? As much as it hurts me to say it, I want you to memorize that 22.4 liters equals one mole for a gas at standard temperature and pressure. That is something that you need to have for your test. I also want you to recognize the utility of PV equals NRT okay? and your own algebra skills to see the relationships between these. What is the relationship between volume and temperature? Up and up. Vol pressure and volume. Up and down. They're inverse. Pressure and moles. Up and up. Pressure and temperature. Up and up. Moles and volume. Look at the expression, volume and moles. If moles go up, what happens to the volume? It has to go up. How about volume and temperature? Uh, 
Why up and down? To see that relationship, they need to be on opposite sides of the equation. So what should you do? PV over temperature equals NR. When you increase the moles, what would have to happen to the temperature? This becomes hard. If we increased the temperature, would the moles go up? Right? So pick some temperatures. Pick one as a temperature, and whatever our moles would be would be one, right? So let's pick a larger temperature. What's a larger temperature than one? Two works. Does two work? Yeah, two will work. Temperature went up. What happened to the moles? It went down. Is it up and up? No. Nope, it's up and down. They're inversely related. Right? You can get that from looking at the equation and manipulating those terms and seeing those relationships. If you have a hard time seeing it with just the terms, it's really simple to just plug in some numbers and see what happens. We picked a temperature of 1. Will we ever be at a temperature of 1? <coughs> What's the unit of a temperature at 1? Kelvin. Are we ever going to be at 1 Kelvin? No, you would be very dead. Okay. <laughs> Temperature of 2 is twice as big. You can see that relationship. Are you ever going to be there? No, still doesn't matter. We at least can establish that clean relationship. Why did we pick 2? It gets us to a number that we can calculate very easily in our heads without having to pull out a calculator. And we can see that relationship. Make sense? Yes, Christian. Yes. Opposite sides, and we have to be a little bit careful with it. Opposite sides and in the same location. Yes, they'd be directly related. Okay. So some other gas stuff. Dalton came through law of partial pressures. Remember, the gas particles do not interact with each other; they just fly by. Okay. So if I have a pressure of oxygen and a pressure of hydrogen. They are both impacting the sides of the container, which means they are both contributing to pressure. Okay? Are they affecting each other? No. That was one of our simplifications for the ideal gas law, which means for Dalton's law of partial pressures, add up the pressure for each individual gas, that will equal the total pressure. Like that's it. All right, so as an example question, we have a bunch of noble gases, okay, and I'm given their partial pressures. Damn, millimeters mercury. Am I responsible for understanding millimeters mercury? All I'm responsible for knowing is it's a pressure. That's all I need to know. What is the total pressure of the sample? What would I need to do? Add them all up. What would my unit be? Millimeters of mercury would not ask you to do the conversion. You don't need to worry about it. You just add all the, all the numbers up. That's it. Make sense? Okay. Absolute zero. If we look at temperature versus volume, okay, we can plot these things out. And one of the things that we'll note is that as we continue to degree, decrease the temperature, the volume decreases as well. Okay? And it will reach a minimum at zero, zero. Okay, we have to extrapolate the line. Why do we have to extrapolate the line? It's hard to recreate. Practical domain. What happens is I decrease the temperature of a gas. Oh, it solidifies. It changes phases to a liquid or a solid. If this is attempting to look at the volume and temperature relationship for a gas, at some point I'm not going to be able to monitor it anymore because it's, it's no longer a gas. So that's why the dotted line is showing up. If we extrapolate that through or back, assuming we could keep it as a gas, we'll notice that it passes through the origin, zero, zero. Okay? So at zero temperature, our objects will have zero pressure and zero volume. Okay? So kind of a neat little observation. Questions about that?
really that's the origin of absolute zero for Kelvin. Okay? Believe it or not, I don't think I've mentioned it this semester. Someone has allegedly discovered evidence for negative Kelvins. What? Yeah. That's interesting. Not zero. They didn't, they didn't achieve zero Kelvin. They achieved negative Kelvins. They didn't go through zero. Don't break your head. All right. So now what we're going to do is jump back to chapter 9. We've got a couple big concepts left, left in chapter 9. I'm going to bounce a little bit to make sure we've at least talked about those concepts so that next week, Monday, we can do a little bit of practice with them instead of thinking about the con or what the concepts are. We'll look at practice with them. Does that make sense? Tuesday. Tuesday. Not Thursday, though, because Thursday is the test. Thursday next week. Next week. Thursday next week. You thought it was Tuesday? It does say it does say it says it's Tuesday? Oh. Thursday though. It's Thursday. Tuesday. That sucks. We'll see where we get. <laughs> Thursday's the visit. Thursday's, Thursday's the kids book activity across the street. Yeah, so it can't be Thursday. It's got to be Tuesday. So what will end up happening is some of the content's going to get pushed. It's going to show up on the exam because it's already written. Um, and it'll just be moved to extra credit. So we'll account for it that way. Um, limiting reactant. We've already talked about this. So this should be really straightforward, okay? So we'll talk real quickly through a simple example. Let's take a look at some sandwiches. I wanna make a cheese sandwich. I'm gonna take one slice of cheese, two slices of bread, and ta-da, sandwich, okay? Keep it simple. Thank you. Everybody complains about the mustard, but you need the mustard. Mustard? Yeah. Cheese and mustard? You don't even need the bread. All you need is the cheese and the mustard, and you got a perfectly awesome mustard sandwich. <laughs> if you have five slices of cheese and eight slices of bread, how many sandwiches can you make? Four. How'd you come up with four so fast? You can make eight if you do half sandwiches. I didn't ask for half sandwiches. <laughs> How'd you come up with four? Five slices of cheese. One slice of cheese, shouldn't I get five sandwiches? No. I don't have enough bread. So what you guys were able to do in your head is run those conversions fairly quickly using that chemical equation. Okay? That's what you need to do with all of our chemistry stuff. It's the exact same process. So let's go through and write out our process on this. What am I being asked to solve for? Sandwiches. What am I given? Okay, I'm given eight breads. How do I convert bread into sandwiches? Two bread, one sandwich, which means four sandwiches. Or sandwiches, five slices of cheese. One slice of cheese one sli makes one sandwich, and I get five sandwiches. The question asks is the most you could make. Five is larger than four. Why is the answer not five? You ran out of the bread. Okay? What you just addressed is a limiting reactant. There is something that limits the ability to make more sandwiches. What is that species that is limiting this? The bread limits it. We look for our smallest number of sandwiches. Whatever generated that, that's our limiting re reagent. What would be our reagent in excess? The cheese. We had more than enough cheese. Okay? We actually didn't use all of our cheese. Kind of make sense? Okay. So what we end up going through and doing is the same thing for chemistry. Two moles of sodium carbonate mixed with two moles of water, one mole of carbon dioxide. How many moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate are produced? What do we have to do? Balance 
Having a balanced equation is useful. This one is balanced. I want moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. What did I start with? One mole of CO2. I want to get rid of moles of CO2, and what do I want? Sodium hydrogen carbonate. What's the numerical relationship between those? Two moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate, because there's a two in front. One mole of CO2, which means I get two moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Does that mean that's how much is produced? Not necessarily. What would I have to do? I have to go through and do the other ones. What was I given? Two moles. The number's there. Two over one. Thank you for doing the math. I was going to write two. I was also given two moles of water. So while I'm frantically writing this out, does anybody see something? That they're like, but why didn't you just do that? Was there a faster way to come up with the answer? Add all the moles together. Interesting. I didn't actually... Well, that's not going to work, right? 2, 2, and 1 is 5. And my answer was 2. So that didn't work. Okay? If we think back to the cheese example. 5 slices of cheese, 8 slices of bread. Gets me how many sandwiches? 4 sandwiches, not 13. So it's not just adding the numbers up. So the, which one was the limiting reactant? Okay, this was our limiting reactant. Nothing, nobody wants to volunteer something and be like, but didn't you already know that was a limiting reactant? No? Yeah? yeah. yeah. Why? What? On the product, it says there's two. Two sodium hydrogen What does that have to do with one mole of CO2? One mole of CO2 two moles of sodium hydrogen So what you're saying is with this calculation, we get two. And with this calculation, we get four. All you're saying is you're looking at the calculations. What you've done is internalize this calculation still. You have. Hatem, because I liked your suggestion. Why were you thinking this was a limiting reagent? Five slices of cheese, eight slices of bread. The five slices of cheese was less? Mm -hmm. The bread was your limiting reactant at eight. Not the cheese. So what typically people will say in response to this is that one mole of CO2 is the lowest number. Because it is the lowest number, it must be the limiting reactant. Did that work with the bread example? No. No. Will it always work? No, in fact, it works roughly 50% of the time, okay? which means, how do you solve? You do all the math behind it. If you decide to do that in your head, you are fine to do that in your head. That is up to you. That is your decision. This would be a level of multiple choice question because the calculation you're being asked to do is very, very short and simple. Not a whole lot of work is needed. 
how could I make this now a not show your work question? Or sorry, a show your work question. How could I make it more difficult? I could change the numbers. I could change the equation. Ultimately, it's just going to change all those relationships. It's going to be the same basic format. Unbalancing the equation would make it a little bit more difficult, but that's now unit two. We're in unit three. You've got to do a little bit more work. It's just as difficult as this one. What did I change? The unit. Now they're in grams. Is this a one-step conversion anymore? Nope. nope. What are you going to have to do? To grams. grams to moles. Now you can do your moles to moles. Okay. Then you'd have your moles a product. Make sense? So you have to stack those conversions that we've run from the previous system. You guys want a little practice? Yeah. Cool. There you go. So let's take a look. <clears throat> this question has a typo because it was written really fast and I haven't had time to go back and fix it too much. How much water can you make? What are we solving for? H2O. What about the H2O? An amount. Grams, moles, liters. It doesn't say, which means bad question. You should pick whatever you want to convert to. Because you now have the power to decide what unit your answer should be in. Because it wasn't given to you. You could make it anything you want. Literally. What's going to be the easiest thing for you to do? Moles. That's what you should pick. What were you given to start with? You were given moles of hydrogen. Moles are the same, the substance has changed. So I need H2 in the denominator so it cancels, and I need H2O in the numerator. Where do I find a substance conversion? From a balanced chemical equation. Is the chemical equation balanced? No, so we would have to balance it. What unit? What measurement unit? Moles. Why was moles the easiest one to use? There it is. It's one conversion. Done. What's our answer? 1.5 moles. Okay. What was the other one? Still solving for moles of water, starting with moles of oxygen. One mole of oxygen. I want oxygen to become water. This needs to be moles. What's the relationship? Two moles of water. Which equals two. two moles of water. What was our limiting reagent? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. How much water could we have made? 1.5 moles. Okay. I saw a bunch of people go into grams. That's possible, and some of that is probably coming from the bad question, not actually providing what the amount was. Okay. You're not making it better by not specifying the answer, what unit you want for an answer. So if you wanted to go to grams, that's okay. But what you should be writing first is grams of water. If you're not writing that, you're wrong. That's how it's going to work. Okay? Kind of, sort of? Okay. So, percent yields. Okay, we all mined copper ore last week, right? Clean that up. Uh, how much copper ore did you guys find? <clears throat> What was not a lot? Give me a number. 0. 0.9? 0. 0.9 grams. I went through and I got 6 grams. Who has the more valuable copper mine? What? 
depends on how much I used. I measured that six grams out of a ton of dirt, literally one ton. Who has the va more valuable mine? Now you guys do. But I have more copper. I had a lot more dirt, okay? A raw value is useless, okay? How many of you want a 90 on the next exam? It's out of 200, guys. Okay? Knowing your numbers is a pretty big deal. We need that comparison on what your possible total is. Make sense? Okay. This is why we invented percents. Our percent yield is an actual over the theoretical maximum. 90 out of 200, not so great. Okay. 90 out of 100, pretty big difference. Okay. So we need to be very clear on what those are. What are our units? If you get 90 pages, right, and the exam is 200 points. That doesn't make sense. That makes no sense. How do you get 90 pages right and 200 points? Those units don't align. A percent yield is unitless. Whatever unit you decide to be your actual needs to be the unit for the theoretical. It can be whatever you want it to be. Okay? <clears throat> So typically, it's grams of product, right? It's whatever your product is. But it could just as easily be moles of product, okay? It doesn't really matter. But it's actual over theoretical. So if we looked at this question, two moles of sodium carbonate mixed with two moles of water, one mole of carbon dioxide, and 0.5 moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate are produced, then what is the percent yield of the sodium hydrogen carbonate? You guys already solved half of this. You solved what your theoretical amount was, the maximum you could have made. Okay? And I know you solved this already because we already wrote it up on the board. And because you guys were following along and wrote down awesome notes, you know that our theoretical yield was? Theoretical yield is not a percent. Theoretical yield is a number followed by a unit. What was it? One mole of CO2, moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. This was that exact question where you're like, you could just look at those numbers and figure it out, David. This is why we write down our work. Moles of CO2, moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Okay, two, one, we would get two moles. If we tried this with the water and the sodium carbonate, what are we going to get? Four. Four moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. This is our theoretical yield. How do I get the actual yield? What do you mean just do it? Actually do the experiment would one be one way to do that, except we're in the lab. We can't actually do anything. How do you get the actual yield? And only 0.5 moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate are produced. Should you read the directions? I know it's been six hours of talking. Three hours. It's brutal. Felt like six. Welcome to lab. <laughs> so our actual yield is 0.5 moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. How do I calculate a percent yield? Actual 0 0.5 moles over 2 moles. And we get 25% yield. That's how we calculate a percent yield. Okay. Could it be more difficult? Yes. How could it be made more difficult? You could get a question like this. Okay. To answer this question, what do you have to be able to process your way through? Directions. You have to know the formula for magnesium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, unit two. What type of reaction occurred, unit two? 
products that were yielded, unit two. A balanced chemical equation, unit two. Maximum yield of magnesium hydroxide is a limiting reagent, unit three. Maximum yield of hydrochloric acid is a limiting reagent, unit three. Which is the real limiting reagent? Three. Actual and theoretical yields, percent yield, three. This doesn't take into consideration that when you write out those formulas that you have to have the proper charges balanced. Where do the charges come from? Uh, Unit one. All of these questions need to get answered before you can answer the big one up top. Okay? You have the ability to do this. Okay? I have every faith that you can do this. It is challenging and it requires you to show your work through this entire process. That is difficult. I will completely grant you that. Okay? But you have the ability to do so. Okay? So you should work through this because it gives you good, solid practice on everything you should have learned in Unit 2, which you should be fast at now because you've been practicing. The Unit 3 stuff may take you a little bit longer. Okay? When it comes to the exam, extra credit. Extra credit is going to be empirical formulas. It is also going to be molecular formulas, which are right... Whoops, I passed it. Molecular formulas right there. Okay. You want help with that? This is literally the steps to do them. Because that's how I talk about emp empirical and molecular formula. It's just solve it. Okay. They're kind of archaic, kind of, or archaic scientifically. What the formula means is stuff we've already addressed. Okay. And you know how to do that. Okay. Work on it. If you've got questions, feel free to ask. But we are done until the test.